You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in and checking out the Straight to Video podcast. As always, I'm your host Rob Lane and you know what? This past weekend I got the chance to do some live rock shows. Yep, that's right. Live gigs in front of real life people and you know what? It was awesome. This podcast has really kept me occupied over the past year or so and if I'm honest, because of that it's taken my mind off playing live a little bit, which I've done pretty consistently for over 20 years. So whilst it has been kind of cool to take a left turn from that, Once I got the call from my old friend Hilda to come and be a part of the second version of the band The Needful Things, which is basically a bunch of us from other bands playing each other's songs, then I was in. And you know what? I'm super glad I did. Whilst I didn't think I'd missed it that much, once we all started playing, it all came back. The feeling of playing on a stage, the vibe from the crowd, everything was right once again for that hour or so. So hopefully, fingers crossed, this is things returning to normal and I'm eager to feel that magic again, whether it be from the stage or from the crowd, because that really is something special indeed. But anyways, on today's show, I'm super excited to bring you a chat with filmmaker Taylor Morden. Taylor is the director and associate producer of the wonderful documentary movie The Last Blockbuster, which focuses on the last remaining blockbuster video store in the world, which is located in Bend, Oregon, over in the USA. Now, to think how huge the blockbuster video chain, along with the whole of the VHS and DVD industry, was, and how it's now become a real thing of the past is crazy. It's really become obsolete, so to think that one of the stores still exists is super intriguing, and it's really brought to life beautifully in this great documentary. The film shows the real heart behind this last remaining store, and if you don't hark back with fondness to visiting your own video shop after watching it, then... You may be listening to the wrong podcast, that's all I could say. What was also cool to learn is that Taylor is a huge music fan too and is responsible for two essential music documentaries in the form of his debut film Here's to Life, all about our friend Roger Klein and his 90s band The Refreshments and of course The Peacemakers. Plus Taylor also released his love letter to 90s ska punk in the form of Pick It Up. For more information on these and of course the last blockbuster then please check out popmotionpictures.com for all the links on how to watch. Before we get into my chat with Taylor I want to thank all the wonderful people who support the Straight to Video Patreon page over at patreon.com forward slash stvpod including our latest supporter Chris Novak who has been a massive champion of the show already and always sends great encouraging comments so it's awesome Chris that you're also part of the Patreon page too so thank you so much. If you out there would like more info on how to help support the show and in return get behind the scenes access, early info on guests and exclusive merch, then all of that can be found at patreon.com forward slash stvpod. And also, don't forget about grabbing a sweet discount from our friends Dead Skull Coffee, who are offering up 15% off any of their fantastic ground or full bean coffee. Simply head on over to deadskullcoffee.co.uk, fill your basket and enter the promo code STV on checkout and the discount will be applied. Alright, this chat was a whole lot of fun because I could relate a lot to Taylor's early years growing up, obsessed with pop culture, TV shows and being a kid with a big imagination. So if that sounds like you too, then I hope you enjoy my straight to video chat with Taylor Morden. First off, though, I'm a little jealous of your Polly Shaw VHS and signed photo haul you posted on Facebook. Yeah, that... Uh, That's a score right there. <laughs> total, I think, of $3.50 for both of those. 
and I, I can't bring myself to open the VHS. It's still, you know, in the cellophane. It's got the Kmart price tag on it. That baby's factory fresh. Yeah, I've got it on DVD, so I can watch it that way. But <laughs> Awesome. So um, where are you now? Are you in Oregon at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, I'm in Eugene, Oregon. I just moved over here from Bend, where Blockbuster is. So I'm still unpacking, but... If I'm right, are you originally from San Francisco, where you went to school, then spent your summers in Oregon? It was kind of like a dual thing? Yeah, yeah. I was born in San Francisco. My parents split up and my dad moved up to Oregon, and I would come up here for the summers. And then around junior high, I switched and I lived up here and spent summers back down in California. And then sort of gradually, I just stayed up here in Oregon. But I was a Californian until I was uh, 14 or so. Was the pros and cons to that, spending summers one place? Or was you like, I'm missing out what all my friends are doing during the summer vacation? Well, I didn't have a ton of friends. My friends were television shows and action figures, so they came with me. Right. Uh, Same here. <laughs> my friends were the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and they never let me down, you know. No, I did have some friends. And then, you know, when you just spend summers in a rural place, the town in Oregon that I would come to is the middle of nowhere, maybe 30 people lived in the town. I didn't know people to hang out with. So I just played by myself with action figures down by the river or build a tree fort and things like that. It wasn't until I moved up here that I met other people my age and sort of made some friends. But yeah, there's pros and cons. I think my imagination got a good workout. You know, when you have to play by yourself, you have to be more creative. And, you know, growing up not having a lot of money, I would like make my own play sets and things for toys or art projects and things like that. And that's kind of stuck with me throughout the rest of my life. Did you have brothers and sisters then who moved with you? So I had an older half brother who lived in Texas, who I saw very rarely. And then I had a younger half sister who was five years younger, who lived uh, with my mom in California. And then sort of when I moved, I moved away before she was 10 years old and we'd never really, and she would spend half her time with her dad. So I didn't really have siblings that I lived with. I've learned from other people that my brother and sister were more like what other people think of as cousins who you see sometimes. And, you know, we didn't live in the same house, really. And you're obviously still a big pop culture guy and collect a lot of memorabilia. Which were your big things growing up? You mentioned Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but anything else? Ninja Turtles was huge. Yeah, Ninja Turtles was huge. And uh, Star Wars, which, I mean, you can see behind me. And my older brother worked at a comic book store. And so he would give me just random things like Ninja Turtle comics before the cartoon came out and things like that. And weird, you know, offshoot Valiant comics or these flaming carrot comics, not the Marvel and DC stuff that most people grow up with. Although I did read X-Men pretty thoroughly throughout the 90s. I was always a Marvel kid. But Star Wars, you know, a little bit of comic books and um, Ninja Turtles, but also just pop culture, movies and TV. You know, I love sitcoms. As a kid, I would just watch sitcoms all day long. What was your entry point to Star Wars then? Because you're a little bit younger than me. Yeah. Uh, well, my older brother was a big Star Wars fan. And so I was born in 81, which is when Empire came out. And my first exposure to Star Wars, I have a pretty clear memory of maybe 1986. So I would have been like five years old. Somebody put on Return of the Jedi on VHS. So I saw that movie first. And as a little kid, you know, Ewoks and laser swords and oh my God, and the speeder bike scene. Jabba's palace, holy shit, and assault. Oh my God, yeah, robots, what? There's so much going on. And it was one of those, like, I think we were on vacation or visiting somebody and they're like, what do we do with the kid? I don't know, stick him in front of Star Wars and that'll buy us two hours. And then, you know, a couple of years later, when we were able to get VHS copies, I would just watch them over and over and over again and play with action figures. And I would sit and act out the scenes with the action figures while they were on the TV. I probably wore out my Empire VHS as a kid just from watching it over and over again. And then I was a teenager in the 90s when they were re-released in theaters. I wasn't like so into it in the early 90s when I was, I'm 13 now, I'm all grown up. I don't need kids toys, but... You know, I think 97 is when they were re-released in theaters. 
years. I was 16 years old. It was perfect. And I didn't know that the special editions were bad at that time. It seemed like cool. Oh, it was a big deal at the time. Yeah. Big deal. I think I went to see the Star Trek movie, which had the trailer for the special editions before it. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big Star Trek fan, but I wanted to see the trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a big deal. And I remember that was one of the few times because, you know, the movie theaters, you could just stay and I would just watch like twice in a row Star Wars in the theater because if you leave, you got to pay to get back in. But if you just stay and watch it again. <laughs> Babe, did you have a local cinema you went to all the time? Kind of. In San Francisco, when I was really young, there was one I could walk to. It was about a mile and I would walk down, you know, I'd have to save up my allowance or wash a neighbor's car or something, maybe get down there and see. And I remember that's where I saw Jurassic Park and some of those earlier 90s big theater movies. But I didn't go to the theater a lot. I was more of a video rental, whatever was on TV. You know, they used to show movies, ABC Sunday night. They had a movie every week and we have those. And it was broadcast. I didn't have cable. So there was like one channel way up on the dial that would show old movies. It would have like 70s movies and early 80s movies in the 90s. And that's what I would watch. So like I would see Jaws 4 years before I ever saw Jaws because that's the one that was on TV. You obviously got some Star Wars memorabilia behind you. Do you manage to save anything from when you was a kid? Or are you doing like what a lot of us do? And we got rid of it at one point. Now we're trying to buy it all back. I do have those regrets. I did get rid of a lot of things, but I do have a lot of my original Star Wars things and Ninja Turtle collectibles from when I was a kid. And I've added to it, you know, and replaced that I've lost or gotten rid of. It's so interesting, you know, that relationship you have of like, oh man, when I was a kid, I could never afford the Millennium Falcon. It was so big and just out of reach. So I just had the little figures. I made a cardboard Millennium Falcon because what are you going to do? And then, you know, as a grown up, you get a job and you're like, huh, I guess I'll just go. <laughs> I can have it now, you know? Yeah. I've worked hard for this Millennium Falcon. <laughs> Ridiculous world. Music obviously became a big passion for you, though. Was there a particular band or musician that triggered that? So I got into music as a real young kid because it got me out of school. They came around to our classrooms and said, if you play an instrument, you know, for an hour every week, you get to go to the school library and play music instead of, you know, learning your geography or your math or whatever the thing was that I didn't want to do. I hated school. I did well, like I could take tests well, but I hated homework and I hated being in class. I got in trouble a lot for talking too much, making jokes. So I literally got into music through not wanting to do schoolwork. And I played in this school music program. I picked up a trumpet. I was, I think in third grade, you know, my relationship to music as a kid was, oh, I play music. And, you know, there's music on TV, the Saved by the Bell theme song, Ninja Turtles theme song. Those were my, those were my jams as a kid. <laughs> um, and I didn't have like a stereo or anything or a Walkman. So it was that. And then when I was a teenager, you know, you get into cassettes and later CDs and the radio and things like that. But, you know, like my first musical things that I was aware of was like Vanilla Ice in the second Ninja Turtles movie or... <laughs> You know, like not really music. It was just tied to pop culture in that way. Yeah, my first cassette that I bought with my own money was the original score to Jurassic Park. So it was just orchestral, you know. Na, 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 na. And I listened to that thing over and yeah. over and over because I like dinosaurs. It's like I didn't associate music as its own thing until much later. You know, when I was 13, 14 years old, I was like, oh, yeah, music. You can just like the music. It doesn't have to be tied to dinosaurs or Ninja Turtles. It can just be music. Was there any particular bands which kind of really brought that to your attention? I think Weezer was big for me. In the early 90s, I got a computer, an IBM Aptiva. And it was one of the very first ones that had a CD-ROM. And it came with this CD-ROM that had the Weezer Buddy Holly music video on it. So it was the first time I had seen video on a computer. And so again, it's like tied to this pop culture thing computers and we're like hey here's this band so i saw that music video i don't know a thousand times because i was fascinated that you could play a video on a computer it was probably 300 pixels wide by 200 pixels tall but i loved 
that kind of style of music. And I was into grunge and, you know, Nirvana and Pearl Jam and all that in the 90s. And then later, because I was a trumpet player, as soon as I found out about ska music, which is like this punk rock music with trumpets in it, that was, that became my life. The dots connected all of us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Rock and roll meets the school band. Of course, that's, I'm in. Had filmmaking been on the radar at all around this point? As a kid, no. I did love, like, I had the VHS that came with Star Wars that was called From Star Wars to Jedi that was the making of the trilogy that showed, you know, people making puppets and people building little miniatures and doing that. And I was always fascinated by that because, you know, I was making cardboard spaceships at home. So I thought, well, that's cool. I still probably wanted to be an archaeologist when I grew up, but it didn't really occur to me that that was something you could do until I saw that VHS tape. We never had a video camera growing up, so I couldn't do, I just, you know, I'd play pretend with the action figures and in my mind, there were stories, but not until high school. I went to high school out in Oregon in a very small town. The school had one big bulky VHS camcorder the kind you put on your shoulder that you could borrow if you were doing a school project. And I love TV and movies, so I'm fascinated. And I just started asking, oh, there's a book report due on this Shakespeare thing. Could I do a video instead? Okay, great. I got to do a report on Egypt. Can I do a video instead? So you took the incentive. Yeah. Yeah. Again, to get out of school. Everything I'm into is because I didn't want to do school, but I would borrow this video camera. And, you know, if you could... If you had a project that was over the weekend, you could take it home for the weekend. And that was really when I got into doing that. But to edit, you know, you would have to plug a VCR into another VCR and push pause and play to do edits and record. And it was very difficult, but I was so fascinated with like, oh man, I can make it go from one shot to another shot. And if I plug my Walkman into this audio input, I can add music to this scene. Like I was just trying to figure it out. There was no real internet at that time. So I was just trying to like piece it together. You know, I would read the video camera manual and try to, oh, it can do, there's a freeze frame button. And if you push that and you stand in the shot and then you push the fade out button, it'll look like you disappear. It's like high tech special effects. Your music was pretty successful though, in that you've recorded several albums, opened for some of your favorite bands. And did you even tour Japan and China at some point as well? Yeah, in the late 90s and throughout the early 2000s, I was playing a lot. I played in several bands and, you know, some of the more successful bands we did get signed in Japan and we were on MTV over there and did a few tours. And um, one of those I piggybacked on and went to China because we were so close. And so we've done that. I haven't toured much in America, ironically, um, because mostly because I was a little late to the ska game and it wasn't quite popular here anymore. But I've opened for most of my favorite bands over the years. I got to play with Weezer. I got to do a a co-songwriting thing with them about a decade ago, perform and and produce a track that's actually on one of their albums, which was big. And it's just sort of that, um, you know, anything you stick to long enough. If If you're a Weezer fan for 25 years and you stay at it you can probably bother them enough to let you hang out with them (laughs) you'll cross paths at some point exactly so what was the transition point from music to film then was there because i would imagine you was pushing the music pretty seriously yeah yeah the the film thing was i would make music videos you know for bands i was in or for friends bands but i was always kind of just working i did flash animation for the internet when the internet was flash and (laughs) I would work just enough, you know, make just enough money so that I could go on tour and not worry about paying the bills. But I never had like an office job. You know, I was doing web design or flash animation, sort of freelance on the side. And that would sort of afford me the flexibility to, you know, oh, we're going to go play three states away next weekend and drive the van and the whole thing. Sure. I'm available. That is pretty priceless just to be able to do that. Yeah. And that was, you know, my whole 20s and early 30s was based around that. I, w- I was going to be famous musician, you know, <laughs> and I, I didn't quite go the way I planned, but I got what I wanted out of it. You know, I don't think there's a better way to see the world than with a group of friends and you play a concert every night. You probably met so many people during that time. As yeah. Well. Most of my best friends came from playing in bands or music and that sort of kept going and going until Apple 
didn't support flash on their iPads and iPhones, I think around 2008, 2009, they said, we're not going to support flash anymore. And all of a sudden I didn't have a job. You know, <laughs> this is what I had been doing for the better part of a decade. And I'm just like, okay, I know how to edit video. I can maybe do some of that. And this was around the time that the DSLR cameras were starting to shoot video that looked good, you know, like instead of a little Sony camcorder, I could get a, like a nice Canon camera with a real lens that you could focus and all that stuff. So I scraped together what I could and bought a really cheap DSLR and started trying to do video. You know, I'll, I'll shoot a music video for you for a hundred dollars. No big deal. I'll do it. Commercial. Great. And then I, I was living in Washington, DC where there was a lot of, there's just a lot, you know, there's a lot of uh, national organizations and people. So I was able to find enough work to sort of have that be my job. And I did that for a while, still playing in bands, but now doing video on the side instead of flash animation. And then when I moved back to Oregon about six years ago, I moved again to a small town and there wasn't work. You know, if you're in a big city, there's a lot to film all the time. Plenty of work. Word soon gets around as well, I would imagine. You can bounce from one project to the next. Exactly. And then you move across the country to a small town. There's not enough work. Nobody knows who you are. Nobody cares. And that's when I started just, well, I have a little bit of money saved up and I'm not playing in a band right now. Maybe I'll try to make a movie. Sweet. And is that around the time? Because you've done a few short films, but you eventually worked with Roger Klein on the movie Here's to Life, which is fantastic. Oh, thank I you. I love it. Yeah, that was my first big... That was like my experiment. You know, I reached out to them and said, hey, I want to come. I thought maybe I'll do a short film or something. I just, I was fascinated because I was a fan of the refreshments in the 90s. And about 2015, I had seen them in Washington, D.C. Roger Klein came through and I was one of those people. I was a huge refreshments fan, you know, had both albums, listened to them nonstop. But because they broke up, when the internet wasn't really a thing, I had no idea that they kept going. So that was news to me and I was shocked. And then I told my friends who were also into that band, hey, did you know that they're still playing and it's like half the original guys, they play all the old songs and we've been missing out for 20 years. And that seemed like a, a fun idea that at least people like me who are fans of the old band and didn't know about the continued story would find this story interesting. But also from a documentary standpoint, it's a small story, right? I just need to get access to this one band and a few of their friends and I can make this movie. So I reached out and they said, sure. I mean, we don't know who you are, but come down to Phoenix and hang out and we'll see. So I did and it worked out, but that was really just me seeing if I could make a movie at all. Was it Kickstarter funded? Yeah. When they told me about their fan base and how big their yearly festival was and, you know, they're selling out all these dates, I think it was Roger who suggested, he said, if you just do a Kickstarter, the fans will pay for the movie. And I said, oh, OK, well, that's that's better than me paying for it. I don't have any money. <laughs> was you surprised when you like tapped into that whole because it's more than just a fan base, it's a whole community. Yeah, I learned a lot doing that movie and I'm still, you know, pretty connected to the fan base and the band. And it's been great. It's, it's fascinating because it's not like other bands, you know, they have, it's almost like a cult following where they've put Roger up on this pedestal and you know, his word is gospel. It's kind of amazing. And he's a great guy and the music is fantastic. It's very well deserved, but it's rare in music for someone to reach that status, but still be relatively unknown. Yeah, it's so cool. I mean, was that inspiring or maybe like an influence on your future projects? Because I think you said that you yourself are your target audience. If you love something, there's got to be like others out there. It's just a matter of finding them and you put your passion into it and other people will relate to it. Yeah, that's exactly how I decide if I want to do a project. If it's interesting to me, if, if I would watch that movie, then I just assume because I'm, I don't know, I'm not that interesting. I'm kind of like, I know a lot of other people just like me, who like Star Wars and Ninja Turtles and go to comic book conventions and listen to 90s music, even though it's now oldies. So I figure if I'm interested in something, there's got to be a million other people who are interested in it. And I happen to be the one who can turn it into a movie. And maybe if I'm lucky, sell it to these other million people. I think it's a similar thing, like they say, with the music these days, the music industry, it's all over the place now. But if you can get that, what they say, a thousand super loyal fans. Right. And you just look at it from the point of thousand super loyal fans. If they'll chuck a hundred dollars to you every year, 
That's a hundred thousand dollars a year. <laughs> yeah, and I I certainly don't have that, but I have. Uh, but that kind of mindset. Yeah, I might have a hundred thousand real passive fans that would kick me fifty cents. So that's something. So um, the last blockbuster, amazing job. I loved it. One of the things I personally took from the film, and I don't know if there's a similar feeling in the US, but a lot of people have like, oh, Blockbuster came along and wiped out all the mom and pop stores with the big corporation machine. But I think what your movie does is get rid of that a little and shows the heart in these stores, Mm -hmm. those communities, and the fact there was like two sides to Blockbuster. There was the corporate side, but also the franchise side, which is what the location in Bend, Oregon is, which Sandy, the centerpiece of your movie, focuses on. So I think that's one thing that the movie shows, which I was like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that because I'm from like the 80s of like the tiny grubby video stores and then all of a sudden blockbuster took over and i was like damn you yeah me too and honestly when we started making the movie we thought there would be a lot more of that negative sentiment we thought people would be still holding a grudge right it's been 10 years since blockbuster was a household name and you know when it was a thing i feel like a lot of people like me we went to blockbuster because they had all the new releases and they were guaranteed in stock and you know whatever but I, I love the mom and pop video store, the little you know hole in the wall. The place I rented videos from as a teenager living in that small town was the local gas station. I had to walk a half mile down and, you know, they had one little wall of VHS tapes that you could rent for 99 cents or whatever. And then, you know, I moved to a, a bigger city, which Eugene, where I am now, which had a cool indie video store called Flicks and Picks that I loved because it had the weird offbeat stuff that had the trauma movies it had the obscure stuff that you wouldn't find you'd go in and say you know hey i like terminator 2 what else is there and they would hand you some weird science fiction movie you've never heard of and i still to this day i have no idea what it was but i watched it but i would go to both i would leave that store and then stop by blockbuster on the way home to rent terminator 2 because the little store had one copy and it was always gone what was the like the main inspiration to the film because weren't you living it in or around bend oregon and they originally had two stores and you visited the other one yeah is that right and when i moved there there were still two blockbusters the one right by my house closed the week i moved there and this was in 2015 you know, they had been closing all across the country. And I thought, oh, this is cute. This little town is a couple of years behind and they're just now closing. But I didn't think anything of it. I didn't think, I certainly didn't think there was another blockbuster in this small town because Bend isn't a big enough town. I can't understand. At one point they had four blockbuster videos in this town that maybe had 70,000 people in it, tops. Like, I don't understand Somebody told me when we were making the movie and I couldn't verify it, so we didn't put it in, but that at one point in the 80s, Bend, Oregon had more VCRs per capita than any other place in the United States, which I couldn't verify it, but it sounds true if they were supporting, you know, there were also two mom and pop video stores. So they had like six video stores in this little town. Crazy. You know, it's a, it's a small town and it's an outdoorsy town. You don't think of people staying home and watching movies when they're skiing and, you know, whitewater rafting and all the things people do there. But yeah, what the real, the spark for me was when I walked into the store a couple of years later, when I found the other store, the one that the movie is about, because I couldn't believe it. I was, <laughs> what, what do you mean there's still a blockbuster video and it's still open and uh, it was 2017. So they had, you know, whatever the new, you know, Captain America movie was. And there was a whole wall of it, which, you know, doesn't make sense from a standpoint of, you know, video stores were gone in my mind and for most people and DVDs were dying already. It's like you'd go to Target or a Walmart and there used to be a huge DVD section and that started to get smaller and smaller. So I hadn't seen 50 copies of the same movie in one place since the heyday of Blockbuster. So it was just crazy to go in and see, oh, they're still running this business like it's 2005 and nothing has changed. There has to be a story here. So the day I walked in was the day I asked, may I speak to the manager? I would like to film here. That's crazy. So how did you and Zika, is the right producer, had you guys worked together previously? Yeah, we met through, um, there was a local film meetup group in Bend. And as you can imagine, there weren't a whole lot of people in that group (laughs) because small town and not a lot of filmmakers. And we had connected just because, yeah, you know, I had just done a movie and he kind of had 
what I thought of as like Hollywood experience. He had been a writer on TV shows that I grew up watching, Dexter's Laboratory, Powerpuff Girls. And I thought, oh, okay, well, this guy will know a little bit more about how it's actually done. You know, who you call to get a hold of a Jamie Kennedy or Kevin Smith or whatever, you know, the nuts and bolts of the industry. And we had, you know, kind of hung out a little, but we were we didn't know each other that well. He had invited me over to to watch a movie like six months after I had started filming the last blockbuster. And I was making the ska documentary pick it up at the same time. So I had two movies on my plate. Blockbuster one was getting difficult because there were still a lot of stores open and I wanted to go to all 12 existing blockbusters. And the managers were not no one was as cool as Sandy. No one was cooperating. No one, they were like, don't come here. This is not anything. But I pitched it to Zeke, you know, when he invited me over to watch a movie. And I said, I think there's a story here, but I'm making this other movie and I'm just like overwhelmed and, you know, we're kind of hitting a dead end, but I think we should stick with it. It could be something. And he was just like, I'm in. This is, of course, this is a great, I've been wanting to do a documentary and this is the perfect topic. So we didn't know each other that well when we started, but then, you know, for almost four years, we worked together almost every day on this project. So now we're pretty close. What you say there, though, it's quite cool because during the shooting, there were actually other blockbusters. So it wasn't actually the like last blockbuster when you started. No, not until over two years in. It became the last one in America in 2018. And then in 2019, it became the last one in the world. And we were all shocked, you know, I thought for sure, one of these rural, there was a rural one in Australia, and these two in Alaska that were, you know, in very remote, not really any smaller than Bend, but in Alaska, it's harder to get Netflix streaming. And it's, it's cold, you stay home and watch movies. It makes sense. The logic was there. I was like, oh, it's going to be Alaska. And we're gonna have to change the name of our project to like, one of the last blockbusters or something, or we're going to have to go to Alaska. But we were trying to book a trip to Alaska and uh, the guy who owned the Alaska stores, Alan Payne, who's in our movie, he was visiting Bend to talk to Sandy and Ken about their store in Bend. And I don't know, I guess when you're one of the last blockbuster managers in the world, you're all friends. It's a small group. (laughs) So he came to visit and we interviewed him in Bend because it's cheaper and easier than going to Alaska. And it was during that interview that he told us their stores were, were closing that week and we'd never make it. We're closed. It's over. And that's when we found out that the one in Bend was going to be the last one. And that really changed the trajectory of what we were doing. It was like, oh, well, now this one store that we happen to be focusing on because we lived here, you know, because it was in our backyard, it's going to be the last one in the world. And boy, we're lucky that we've been filming here already for two years, but now we really got to step it up. And that's when we started getting, you know, like the celebrities involved and everything like that, because once you're the last one, it's national news, it's worldwide news, and people got really excited about it. And we were sitting on two years of footage and this relationship with these people. And we're like, oh, now we're making, like, the stakes got a lot higher. So I would imagine you just noticed that whole surge in media activity and coverage all of a sudden. That must have been weird, having been, like, two years invested into it, and all of a sudden everything starts shifting. Yeah, we tracked it from, you know, I would tell people there was a blockbuster in my town and they wouldn't believe me. They'd be like, no, you're, that's whatever. And then, you know, people find out you're doing this. So whenever it pops up in the news or something, people email me or they send it to me on Facebook or they tweet at me. And so I get these blockbuster video memes and like articles sent to me all the time. And when it became the last one, you know, it was a big news story worldwide. And I got hundreds and hundreds of messages. Like, did you know? I know, hey, I know you're working on a blockbuster thing, but have you heard? Like as if, like as if I wasn't going to be paying attention. But that watching it go from at the very early stage, Zeke and I were some of the only people that cared. You know, we were already fascinated that there was a blockbuster video. We were going most days and hanging out and talking to the customers and what is going on here that kind of thing. And then two years later, everybody cares. It's the most fascinating thing. And everybody's got an opinion and they're so interested and they're traveling from all over the world to come to this store. And it's like, you know, I equate it to like when you 
discover a, a small local band in your town and then that band is the Beatles and everybody loves the Beatles and you're just like, but I know them first. It's almost like a perfect storm in a way, like all the blockbusters were closing, boom, 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 going one by one. But all of a sudden, as it gets to that last one, I think it's mentioned in the film, there's almost like this curve in the 90s is suddenly becoming popular again. We've had the wave of the 80s with the Stranger Things. And it, I say it's almost like a perfect storm. It hit just at the right time where people, oh, I remember that. That sparked some magic. It is just a very unique thing. Yeah. And it was just long enough after, you know, I feel like it took four or five years for people to really settle into watching movies on Netflix and Amazon and Hulu. You know, when we started, Redbox was still very, very popular. People would rent their DVDs at the grocery store still. And people were renting movies, you know, on their cable box or on Amazon. And Netflix was popular, but it wasn't like, you know, you look at now and it's some huge percentage of households that have Netflix. It's way higher than it should be. <laughs> um, it's, it's unreasonable to think of these platforms where it used to be, I didn't know anyone who didn't go to a video store and rent movies at least once a month, a lot of people once a week. And now it's all streaming and I don't know anybody who goes and rents a movie. And that was so gradual. Like you said, it was a slow for people to realize, oh, wait, I do miss that. It took five or six years. And so I think that's part of why it took us so long to get the movie finished and to get it out is because at the beginning, nobody cared. It took years for people to realize what they were missing. Had you dove into the VHS cult resurgence at all? Because there'd been films like Adjust Your Tracking and Rewind This. Had you watched those? Yeah, yeah. I love physical media and I'm, I'm an 80s kid. I love... VHS tapes. I recently got back into Laserdisc because I could never afford Laserdisc when they were brand new. It was very expensive. And I only knew like one family that had a Laserdisc player and we were all like blown away. But I love VHS. I've, I've really gotten back into that mostly through doing this movie. And just the tactile, like you see it in our movie when we hand everybody the tape, that just came from me having that experience. I made that VHS prop just to have something that we could take a picture of for our, our promos and things like, look, we're making a movie about VHS. Remember VHS? But it's really about Blockbuster. But when I held it and like clicked it open and closed and smelled it and felt it, that brought me back. Wave of memories. Right. It was like instantly, it's 1987. I'm watching ET and the tracking's off and I got to get up and adjust the tracking. And that relationship that we had to movies when they were hard to get, physical objects that were delicate you know you couldn't get them too hot don't drop it it might warp the tape and the machine would eat it and you'd have to like put it back together carefully that physical memory that sense memory that i have and you have and everybody who was around back then has this memory it's like we're never going to have that with movies that we've streamed right there's no physical connection so a great movie comes out now um, especially in the last year when theaters have been closed the only relationship you have to it is from your couch with your remote. And that's, it's just not the same. So yeah, the VHS thing and the, even DVDs now, it's been so long since DVD was the mm -hmm. cool thing. I have this, this fondness for it. And I'm sure I'm ahead of the curve. No one is nostalgic for the DVD yet. But like when I was in college, DVDs were really, really the thing. And it felt like they were made for me, for people who loved movies, because they had the making of and the behind the scenes and the outtakes. And it was widescreen and really high quality compared to VHS. And the sound, it was in surround sound at my house. It was so cool. And just it blew VHS out of the water. And now they sell DVDs at the dollar store and they can't give them away. And they're just filling up landfills. And that's sad to me and probably... You know, in 10 years, I'm going to make a documentary about DVDs the same way we do about VHS now, because it, it takes a long time for people to realize they miss something like that. And now I put in a DVD and I'm like frustrated because you got to go through the menu and you got to skip the trailer. And it's just like, ugh, why can't I just watch this movie? <laughs> I wanted to touch quickly on some of the music in the film because you yourself perform a version of the Smash Mouth song, All Star. I do. But also, what's the song played at the very end? Is it the one credited that kind of night? to the blockbusters band yeah what's the story behind that because yeah, i've tried yeah. to look for it is it available anywhere i want to say that we got the name wrong in the credits or that they call it something else but it is on itunes i think 
and it's either that kind of night or or one of those nights but if you search for the blockbusters band it might be their only track that's up there but they are a um like a 90s cover band out of LA and we found them you know through people sending me memes and things cuz they all dress up in blockbuster uniforms and they play smash mouth songs and you know other 80s and 90s songs from the VHS era and they're called the blockbusters and we had talked with them about you know doing all the music for the movie and and things like that and it didn't work out for scheduling and and budget reasons but they had this song that they had been sort of working on as a a theme and um they let us use it in the movie and we thought it was a perfect credit song because it was written for this movie which you know an indie movie you don't usually get songs written for your movie you're usually using something somebody else made although we did have a really great the score is original and it was done by a guy I used to play in a band with and we're good friends and and he's been wanting to do movie scores he does a lot of my short films too and he really got the the vibe we were going for but yeah that song those guys i mean if you look on youtube i think you can find videos of them playing in their blockbuster uniforms and finally i think you probably get the award for most creative lockdown project with project 88 were you along with um let me get this right 88 different people and families from all over remade back to the future part two could you let people know a little bit about that? Because it's all on YouTube for people to watch, which I think is awesome. What happened was, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but there's this thing called COVID-19 that's been going around. I don't know if you've heard of it. But what happened is the pandemic first hit, you know, March of 2020 really is when we all heard about it and started to take these precautions and you know I'm a filmmaker I do work from home we were still editing the last blockbuster and doing post and stuff but most of my work is out in the world take a camera out and and a lot of my friends are filmmakers that do the same thing and all of a sudden we were all stuck at home it was you know quarantine times and we we're going nuts it's not my style to not interact with people you know and this was even before Zoom had caught on and we were hanging out like you and I are now. This was like, oh, I'm just alone. I'm scared to go to the grocery store. I'm scared. People were still wiping down their groceries, you know, with disinfecting wipes and toilet paper was scarce. This was to put it in perspective. And I talked to some filmmaker friends and we sort of were talking about what can we do that's creative. You know, we can't cure diseases we can't, you know, protect people, but we can give people something to laugh at or something to keep them busy. But it was really more for the makers, the filmmakers and the people to give us a project that would take a couple of weeks and take our minds off of what was going on, which was a really dark, scary time. And I had heard about there was a Star Wars one years and years ago where they broke it into way smaller chunks. There were hundreds. And I remember I found out about it too late. So I couldn't sign up for a scene to do, but it was so impressive because people were acting and animating and doing stop motion and all these cool things. And they redid all of Star Wars in that way. And this was years and years ago. This was an early internet, probably pre YouTube project. And some others had come along. I think somebody did Robocop and somebody did Shrek. But no one had ever done it during a global pandemic <laughs> under quarantine conditions. And we, what we wanted to do was pick a movie that would be iconic enough with iconic enough characters where it doesn't matter if it's played by a cat in one scene and a sock puppet in the next scene and then a three-year-old kid and then like a cartoon and then a banana. It doesn't matter. You know that's Marty McFly and that's Doc Brown because one has crazy white hair and one's wearing a red puffy vest or whatever the thing is. So Back to the Future... And I'm a huge Back to the Future fan. It's right up there with Star Wars for me. Just didn't quite have the action figures and collectibles when I was a kid, but they do now. So we want to do Back to the Future. But my favorite of the trilogy, which is not a popular <laughs> choice, is the second one. And it was all because of the hoverboards. When I was a kid, I wanted a hoverboard more than anything in the world. And my older brother convinced me once that they were real. And we lived an hour away from Toys R Us and he, the whole drive into town, he's like, we're going to go to Toys R Us. We're going to get a hoverboard. And when we got there, he told me, oh, the government has issued a warning and they're not safe. So you can't have it. He never told me they weren't real. So I went back to school and told all my friends they're real and we just can't have them. And it was years before I found out that that wasn't true. <laughs> but we did, uh, we did Back to the Future 2 and I split it into 88 scenes because when you reach 88 miles an hour, you can travel through time. 
And originally it was just going to be my friends, but I don't have 88 friends who want to make movies. So we had to open it up to the world. I built a quick little website and let people pick scenes. And we tried to just do it, you know, through Facebook, through people I knew. It wasn't working. So we posted it to a Back to the Future fan group. And all oh, of shit. a sudden there were hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of people. It was over 300 people who worked on it in 88 teams, I think in 13 different countries around the world. Some of our scenes are, are in Spanish. You know, their people are doing it wherever they were. All different levels of quarantine and lockdown because of the timing. Some places they couldn't leave their apartments. Some places they could go outside. All different. But the rules were, you know, just use what you have. Do it COVID safe and try to remake, you know, 88 clips is about a minute per team. So try to remake this minute of this movie just however you want and send it back to me and I'll stitch them all together. And we ended up with a kind of a beautiful time capsule of the very beginning of the pandemic, but also a ridiculous remake of Back to the Future 2 that stars cats and dogs and bananas and small children and old people. And that's all available on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. It's called Project 88 if you search for it. And there's some behind the scenes stuff too. We have a bttftoo.com, BTTF2. So you can see like some side-by-side comparisons and and making of stuff because it was really an arts and crafts project a lot of people built hoverboards out of just stuff that they had any feedback from anybody involved in the actual films i have heard that robert zemeckis saw at least part of it and liked it Uh, i think bob gale has seen it and said something like that was fun Uh, we had a couple of people from back to the future too in our remake because somebody knew somebody so the guy who played george mcfly in Back to the Future 2, which is not Crispin Glover, they recast. Jeffrey Wiseman is in our remake. The guy, forget the actor's name, but he's he's in the band. The guitar player who hands Marty the guitar is in our clip as the same character <laughs> handing a little toy guitar. It's beautiful. Wonderful, man. Wonderful. So it really did reach a lot of people. And this was before, you know, this sort of thing caught on last year. And you would see, you know, all these celebrities singing Imagine or remaking The Princess Bride. And that was like a big thing, these Zoom hangouts and movie revisits all through last year. But that hadn't happened yet when we started doing this. We were just trying to do something fun. And um, and it was. It was fun. We actually just got it into a film festival here in Oregon. So it's going to be playing uh, in a couple months at the Klamath Independent Film Festival. So we're... We're all real filmmakers now. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, congratulations on that. Congratulations on the last blockbuster. What's next for you? Have you got anything else in the pipeline? I've got some ideas, but I haven't really started on any any projects. I'm kind of enjoying, because of the pandemic, I have this sort of forced time between projects that I'm not used to. I'm, I'm always doing a million things, so it's nice. And I just moved, so I'm still like unpacking and settling in. We'll see what's next, but... I don't know right now. Well, I appreciate your time, Taylor. I've loved chatting to you. And yeah, I love the film. And uh, hopefully more people in the UK can check it out. Because I don't think it's been on Netflix over here. No, I don't think it is. I think it's on um, places where you can rent. And I know the shipping is probably crazy, but you can get the DVD from Blockbuster, the actual store in Bend, Oregon. They will ship it out to you. It's actually like the only place you can get it the special edition from from Blockbuster and a kid in a Blockbuster uniform will pack it up and mail it to you. And it's the coolest thing. That was one of our big goals when we started was we got to finish this movie so it can be available at Blockbuster.
Many, many thanks to Taylor Morden for taking some time to chat with me here on the Straight to Video podcast. I truly hope you'll check out his film, The Last Blockbuster, which is out now, as it's a real love letter to something that was a big part of my life growing up, and I'm sure a big part to a lot of you lot out there. It really is a fantastic film. For more information, please visit popmotionpictures.com. And if you also like the idea behind Taylor's quarantine remake of Back to the Future 2, which is called Project 88, then that can be found on YouTube or through bttf2tow.com. Don't forget, if you can please check out our Patreon page for more ways to support this show over at patreon.com stvpod. That would be awesome. Or if you simply want to listen to older episodes, then they can all be streamed for free at stvpod.com. As always, I really appreciate your support and I hope you're enjoying all these fun talks. It's a real privilege to continue to bring them to you, so thanks for listening. All right, that's all for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to chatting again real soon. Hold up. 